Oh, greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, John 8, 12. You know the deal. All right, this is going to be part 21 of the Judas, Scepter, and Joseph's Birthright uh, series. This is part, what part is this? The third part of the book and chapter three. And this is called, the chapter title is called, The Other Overturns. So, this is page 246. Yeah, we're getting there. In connection with the prophecies concerning the removal of the crown of David from the head of Zedekiah to the head of a prince who belongs to the hitherto non-ruling branch of the royal family of Israel's race, the Lord said, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more uh, parentheses, moved or overturned until he comes whose right it is, and I will give it to him. And obviously that's speaking of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which is Christ. These words teach that after the removal of David's crown from the head of the den then ruling prince, there were to be three overturns, no more, no less. And that after the third overtone, the crown must rest or stay in the place where it is left by the third overturn until that person comes to whom it belongs by right. Then at least one more overturn uh, will be necessary for that seat of power must yet go back to the city of David. The first of these overturns we have already traced from Palestine to the islands of the Northwest, which are in the Great Waters. We now propose to show that the other two of these predicted overturns took place in those self same islands, or in other words, that these three overturns landed the scepter and throne alternately in Ireland, Scotland, and then England. And that even after the third overturn, the kingdom is still as the word of God declares in the Isles afar off and in the sea. Bob's note here. King James, the guy that gave us the, uh, well, he didn't. King James sponsored and financed the King James Bible. It bears his name, but he didn't call it the King James Version. He called it the authorized version because it was authorized by a king of England. And uh, you'll hear people say that the King James is a Catholic Bible. Well, they're either liars, deceivers, or fools, ignorant fools that don't know what they're talking about. The Vatican, well, I should say the Jesuits, I should say some Jesuits, uh, tried to kill King James. Look up into the gunpowder plot. Guy Fawkes, F-A-W-L-K-E-S, I think it is. Guy Fawkes. Um, what was the name of that movie? Uh, I can't think of it. I don't watch movies, so... You know, I see clips here and there. Or you go over to somebody's house and they're watching that stupid stuff. But, um, you know, the uh, the mask that people from Anonymous wear with the, uh, well, that is a face of Guy Fawkes. He tried to take barrels of gunpowder and blow up King James and Parliament 
so that they could reinstall a Catholic rule in England. Yeah. And uh, the You Know Who's and their Ban King, take those two words and put them together, Ban, B-A-N, and then K-I-N-G, take those words and put them together. Uh, they were expelled um, under King James. And then King James's son, Charles, was killed by um, Cromwell, who let them come back into the country. Yeah. You know, those poor persecuted. Yeah. Yeah, they were kicked out. And, um, but James was, uh, and, and if you, <laughs> You know what? James was a Bible scholar in his own right. You could read some of his writings. He called the Pope Antichrist. Um, he wanted nothing to do with Catholicism. And uh, he was King of Scotland that became King of England. So King James was Scottish from the best thing that I can find out, you know, we don't know any of our history. Zero. Zero. And by the way, Walker, my last name, is a common Scottish name. Well, not real, real common, but it's, it's, it's a common Scottish name. Matter of fact, they make uh, shortbread, which is a fancy name for cookie like a cookie cracker type thing. Uh, Walker shortbread, made in Scotland. Oh, yeah. You ever heard of Johnny Walker? Uh, Scotch, black and red. Yeah. Um, no relation, but, uh, and I don't, I don't drink hardly ever anymore. If all the liquor companies uh, had customers like me, they'd be out of business, but I know who owns the liquor companies. Um, yeah. Did you know the head of Seagram's is uh, the Bronfman family? He was, I don't know if he still is, but he was head of the um, World Jewish Congress. Yeah. 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 Seagram's made a fortune during uh, Prohibition. Uh, they're a Canadian company, by the way. So uh, what does that tell you? But King James was king of Scotland, and he has a lot of writings. Matter of fact, he wrote a uh, paper, I guess you could say, on uh, demonology. So when people say, oh, well, you know, he was a Catholic. Really? That's why he called the Pope an Antichrist? Really? Um, and by the way, the Vatican has a list of forbidden books that Catholics are, you know, not supposed to read. And the King James Bible is very prominent on that list. You will never see a Catholic version of the King James Bible in a bookstore. So, yeah. How do I know all this stuff? Well, you know... Yeah, why, why everybody else is watching television and movies and, yeah, I'm doing research. And you know what's sad is for every site that you can find that tells you that, you know, something that's true, you'll find 10 sites that have some truth but is full of lies. I, it, it takes a lot of digging to come to a conclusion so, yeah. So, uh, the scepter and throne all alternately in Ireland, Scotland, and England, and that even after the third overturn, the kingdom is still as the word of God declares in the isles afar off and in the sea. It will be impossible to follow the history of the overturn of this kingdom unless we take up the thread of history as it concerns the pillar stone. 
Bob's note here. Um, in part 20 uh, and B, the B part, not A part, um, even the uh, even those who have information about the coronation stone make mention of the legend that it was Jacob's pillar stone. And I put two um, links that popped up. So, you know, people don't know. They don't know our history. They don't know their history. They don't know where they came from. So, unless we take up again the thread of history as it concerns the pillar stone upon which the kings of Israel were crowned, for strange as it may be to some people, both ancient and modern history come honestly to the rescue of prophecy and follow the stone through each of these overturns. We have already seen, according to Josephus, Bob's note here, if you don't know who Josephus was, he was a uh, Judean who lived in the land of Judah during the time of Christ, by the way. He was a historian, and from what I understand, he worked for somebody, a, a Roman, but he did a history from Christ's time back and covered some things and uh, he even says that Herod you know you've heard of Herod King Herod uh, Herod was a family and uh, they were the Herodians and they uh, made trouble for Jesus and uh, it was Herod that uh, one of the Herod family that killed all the children in Bethlehem trying to snuff out the life of Jesus. And you can read about that in the Gospels. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Or, I don't know, I don't remember exactly where. But um, the Pharisees worked with Herod. After all, Herod's the one that uh, spent a lot of money putting together the temple you know I'm sure he was the one collecting the tithes and uh, he didn't do all this to honor the Lord God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob no he did this for control you know so what an evil family but according to Josephus they were of Esau Edom and God said he hated Esau, who married into the Canaanite line, which people that deny God has an elect group of people, uh, they say, anybody can be saved. Well, you can look for Esau in the kingdom, but uh, I'm not. So it's sad, you know. Yeah, they'll tell you that uh, we're all equal in Christ, but the you-know-whos are got a special, especially God's chosen people. Well, yeah, I think they are too, but um, I think it's more for the lake of fire than, um, yeah. Do you know God says he's going to have war from generation to generation with Amalek? Who was Amalek? He was a grandson of Herod. I mean, uh, Esau. Esau, Edom. God was not happy with Amalek. Yeah. What does it mean to have a perpetual war generation to generation? Oh, but Chaplain Bob, God loves everybody. And all Amalek's got to do is believe in Jesus and they're saved. Well, you can believe that if you want. But, I don't know. All right, so Josephus was of the of the tribe of Judah and um, wrote a book of history. And um, yeah, I used to have it, but uh, somebody took it and kept it. So whatever. 
We have already seen, according to Josephus, that prior to the return of Judah from Babylon, Ezra received a letter from Xerxes. Who was Xerxes? Uh, well, Ezra was the priest, the high priest, and he's got a book written in the Bible. Uh, read chapter 9 of Ezra if you believe in mixed marriages. And who was Xerxes? Xerxes was uh, some kind of ruler of Persia that conquered Babylon and allowed Judah to return to Jerusalem. So Ezra received a letter from Xerxes, which was so full of offered favors, love, and fraternal greetings that he sent a copy of it to the ten tribes in Medea, Persia, and asked them to return with uh, Judah to Jerusalem. But the ten tribes refused this offer, and Josephus tells us that the entire body of Israel remained in that country. On the other hand, Ezra, who was in a position to know more than more about them says that they decided not to return and also that they took counsel among themselves and resolved that they would go further away into an unknown country. In accomplishing this, uh, uh, Ezra says, um, they entered into Euphrates by the narrow passage of the river for the Most High then showed signs for them and held still the waters till they were passed over. For through that country there was a great way to go, namely of a year and a half. This is in harmony with the following. The breaker has come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out of it, and their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of them. That is in the book of Micah, chapter 2, and verse 13. Micah is one of the minor prophets. Uh, there are those group of books just before the New Testament, the Gospels. It's called Minor Prophet because it's of its size, not because of its importance. There's a lot of prophecy in the Minor Prophets, people. A lot. And oh, by the way, in my playlist, I've got an entire uh, series on the Minor Prophets. So some of the Minor Prophets are only like a page long. So, the book of Joel. The book of Joel is quoted um, in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit and the gift of miracles was given to the apostles. Oh, yeah. But uh, who reads the book of Joel? Almost nobody. I guess I'm weird, huh? Or crazy. I've been called crazy. Crazy about Jesus. The clause, they have passed through the gate, and the one by Ezra, they have entered into the narrow passages or parallel and refer to the same circumstance and place. This gate or narrow passage, which is up among the headwaters of the Euphrates, is now called the Caucasian Pass. Bob's note here. Do you know why white people are called Caucasians? Because they came from the Caucasian Pass or the Caucasus. Yeah. You know, it's amazing in history. Uh, if you ever look at the uh, Sharon Turner, I believe he was a an attorney. He did a, uh, I think it's a six volume set on the history of the Anglo-Saxon race. But it's funny, he traces back the European migrations to the Caucasus, to the Caucasian Pass. He traces the Anglo-Saxons back to this point. But it's funny that Israel disappears from history at this point, going to the Caucasus. And when Israel disappears from history, the Europeans appear. <laughs> you know? So, um, this gate or narrow passage, which is up among the headwaters of the Euphrates, is now called the Caucasian Pass or the Pass of Daniel. As Israel goes out through this pass, Micah says that the Lord is on the head of them, but is left for 
Ezra to say that the Lord gave Israel evidence of his presence because he gave them signs and held, held still the floods as he did at Jordan until they passed over. But while the Lord is with Israel, it is said of their king that he shall pass before or precede them to that unknown country to which they are going. It is for this reason that Hosea says, the children of Israel, the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king and without a sacrifice and without an image or as the marginal reading gives it without a standing pillar. Young in his exhaustive concordance gives among other definitions of this original Hebrew word, both that of memorial stone and pillar. Other scholarly men who have investigated this text in connection with its context even gives us pillar rock or and pillar stone as a correct rendering, you know, an alternate rendering. All this supplemented by the fact that the word of God associates the absent king with the absent pillar stone justifies our conclusion that the pillar in question is the Bethel pillar stone, which was used as a coronation stone. Consequently, it was left with the royal family, which ruled over the Judeans until the overthrow of Zedekiah. We must remember that Jeremiah and his little remnant were taken against their will and against the direct command of God to Egypt. And that while there they dwelt in Taphanhes, T-A-P-H-A-N-H-E-S. Morton W. Spencer says, it is an undeniable historical fact that about 580 BC, i.e. the very time of the captivity of, of Judah in Babylon, that a princess from the east did arrive in the north of Ireland. Her name was Tiphi, T-E-P-H-I, Tiphi, Tiphi, a pet name like Violet, denoting beauty and fragrance. Tia Tiphi, or Tia Tiphi, was her full name found in Hebrew the T, a little one, and Tephi answering to a surname, Taf. The root word is used in many scriptures. Uh, for example, Genesis thirty-four twenty-nine and Deuteronomy one thirty-nine, uh, according to the IDE concordance, which is probably out of print. Her names were interchangeably used as T, Taffy, Taffy's, Tephi, the Eastern princess, and the daughter of Pharaoh. Uh, Bob's note here. When you travel from Egypt, people assume that, oh, you know, where'd you come from? Oh, well, we just came here from Egypt. Oh, so you're Egyptians. Uh, no. I mean, Israel was in captivity under Pharaoh uh, until Moses led them out in the Passover. You know, the Exodus, the book of Exodus, you know. Does that make them e Egyptians? No. They lived in Egypt, but they sure were not um, uh, native Egyptians, knew. So, the Eastern Princess, the daughter of Pharaoh, and Tia Tiphi, either of these served to identify her as the king's daughter. In Egypt, she was offered protection, and from her, the city of Tephanhez, or Daphne was named, doubtless, and to this day we are shown the site of the palace of the Jews' daughter by the Arabs. The fact that she fled the country is still preserved in her name, Terra, meaning one banished or flight. The name of Pharaoh is neither a given nor a surname, but it is the Egyptian name for king or monarch. The very fact that Irish historians called Tia Tefe the daughter of Pharaoh is proof that they knew her as the king's daughter. Also, this name, the king's daughter, is the only one used in the biblical account of the first overturn, the first overturn to designate that daughter of Zedekiah, 
who succeeded him to the inheritance of David's throne, accepting, of course, that metaphorical name, the tender twig of Ezekiel's riddle. Since the name T means little one, and since a tender twig is also a little one, it certainly takes no great stretch of faith to believe that these two names belong to one and the same person. Especially in this case, when we consider that in the Tia Tifi of Irish history, we have a king's daughter with a Hebrew name who not only came from the east, but also from Egypt, and who is the daughter of a Judean. But there are still other facts connected with the arrival of this princess in Ireland, which, as we consider then, will strengthen our faith more and more. Tia Tefai was accompanied by an aged guardian who was called Olam Fola, more Hebrew words which means revealer or prophet. The prophet was accompanied by a man who was his scribe, scribes like a secretary, whom the Chronicles of Ireland called Brug or Brook. Baruch was Jeremiah's scribe while they were in Judea. He went with the little remnant to Egypt and escaped when the rest did for his life, like the lives of the rest of his party, was to, preserve, to be preserved in all places whither he should go. This little company disappeared from Egypt, but surely they reappeared in Ireland for marvel of marvels. They brought with them a pillar stone, which was ever since been used as the coronation stone of the kingdom. Now remember, they took this thing, the stone, to Ireland. Then it was taken to Scotland, and then from Scotland to England. Remember, King James was king of Scotland before he was king of England. And then they, uh, uh, Cromwell de deposed King James's son and uh, allowed the Antichrist back into the country. Yeah. You know, King Charles must have not been a very good king. I, I can't find much information on him, but for the Lord to have allowed Charles to have been overthrown and not given him any protection, Charles must not have been a good king, is my guess. And if I'm bearing a false witness against him, well, uh, I'll have to apologize one day. So, All right. Later T, sometimes spelled Tia, T-E-A-H, Tefi herself was crowned upon this pillar stone and the name of Aaron's capital was changed from Kathir Krofen to Tara, which is another Hebrew word. But at this juncture in history comes to our help and with unquestioned authority declares that from the time until the present, every king and queen who has reigned in Ireland, Scotland, or England has been crowned upon that same self same pillar or coronation stone. Queen Victoria herself was twice crowned upon that stone. The first time as Queen of England, and the second time as Empress of India. On the occasion of Queen Victoria's coronation, June 28, 1837, an article appeared in the London Sun, which gives a description of the coronation chair and the coronation stone as follows. This chair, commonly called St. Edward's Chair, is an ancient seat of solid hardwood with back and sides of the same, variously painted, in which the kings of Scotland were in former periods constantly crowned, but having been brought out of the kingdom by Edward I in the year 1296, after he had totally overcome John Balliol, B-A-L-I-O-L, King of Scots, it has 
ever since remained in the Abbey of Westminster. You ever heard of it? Westminster Abbey? Oh yeah. And has been the chair in which the succeeding kings and queens of this realm have been inaugurated. It is in height six feet and seven inches, in breadth at the bottom, 38 inches, and in depth, 24 inches. From the seat to the bottom is 25 inches. The breadth of the seat within the sides is 28 inches, and the depth, 18 inches. At nine inches from the ground is a board supported at the four uh, corners by as many lions. Between the seat and this board is a stone commonly called Jacob's Jacob's, J-A-C-O-B, you know, Jacob Israel, Jacob's or the fatal marble stone, which is an oblong of about 22 inches in length, 13 inches broad and 11 inches deep of a steel color mixed with some veins of red. All right, this is in, it, this is really interesting. Listen to this. Uh, this is from remember this is from a newspaper over 150 years ago, the London Sun. History relates that this is the stone whereupon the patriarch Jacob laid his head in the plains of Luz. Hmm. So that ends the article. This, as you see, was published more than, he says, 60 years ago, you know, but, but this, this book was written over 100 years ago, so. Before it was thought possible that the Anglo-Saxons were the descendants of Joseph, the inheritor of the birthright blessing which God gave to his fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This article further states that this stone was conveyed into Ireland by the way of Spain about 700 years before Christ. For there it was taken into Scotland by King Fergus about 370 years later, and in the year 350 BC it was placed in the Abbey of Scone by King Kenneth, who caused a prophetical verse to be engraved upon it, of which the following is a translation. And this translation is as follows. Should fate not fail, wherever this stone is found, the Scots shall monarch of that realm be crowned. This antique regal chair, having together with the golden scepter and crown of Scotland, been solemnly offered by King Edward I to St. Edward the Confessor in the year 1297, from whence it derives the appella appellation of St. Edward's chair, has ever since been kept in the chapel called by his name with a tablet affixed to it, wherein several Latin verses are written in Old English characters. The stone maintains its unusual uh, place under the seat of the chair. Prior to the time that King Ed, uh, Kenneth had his verse engraved on that coronation stone, there was a prophetic verse which had attached itself to it, which Sir Walter Scott had rendered one word accepted as follows. Unless the faiths, faiths are faithless grown and prophet's voice be vain, wherever is found this sacred stone, the wanderer's race shall reign. Think of it. For more than 700 years, this stone has been in Westminster Abbey. Dean Stanley, in his Memorials of Westminster Abbey, says, the chief object of attention to this day to the innumerable visitors to the Abbey is probably that ancient Irish monument of the empire known as the Coronation Stones. He calls it a precious relic and says that King Edward I said that it is the one primeval, P-R-I-M-E-V-A-L, monument which binds together the whole empire. The dean further adds the iron rings, the battered surface, the crack which is all but rent its solid mass asunder, bear witness to its long migrations. It is thus embedded in the heart of the English monarchy, monarchy, an element of poetic patriarchal heathen times, which like uh, A-R-A-U-N-A-H's 
threshing floor in the midst of the Temple of Solomon carries back our thoughts to races and customs now almost extinct. A link which unites the throne of England with the traditions of Tara and Iona and connects the charm of our complex civilization with the favors of Mother Earth, the stocks and stones of savage nature. nature. Faithful or foolish, the sentiment of the nation has, through 300 generations of living men, make it, made it felt that Jacob's pillar stone was a thing worth dying for in battle. For the Treaty of Northampton in 1328, the emeralds, pearls, and rubies were carried off without a murmur. But the ragged old stone, oh no, the Londoners, the Londoners would have died for that. The Stone of Scone, S-C-O-N-E, on which it was the custom of the kings of Scotland to be set at their coronation, the Londoners would on no account suffer to be sent away. Dr. Poole says, this stone is a dull reddish or purplish sandstone with a few small embedded pebbles. One of these is quartz and two others of a dark material. The rock is Calcareous, C A L C A R, Calcareous, C A L C A R E O U S. Uh, I guess that refers to calcium, and is of that kind which masons call freestone. Chisel marks are visible on one or more of the sides. There is no rock of this kind in England, Ireland, or Scotland. So, in other words, this rock did not come from anywhere in the United Kingdom. But the Revelation Canon Tristram says that there is a stratum of sandstone near the Dead Sea, just like this stone, which by the English people is called Jacob's Pillar Stone. Jacob's Pillow Stone. This stone is called by the Irish and by the Scots, Leah Fail, L-I-A-F-A-I-L, and the stone of destiny. In Ira, in Irish, Leah is stone and fail is fate. So it's called the stone of fate or the stone of destiny. But it is that only because it is Jacob's pillow, pillar stone. That is the reason that Teotifa is called the daughter of God's house. Logger Lug, Celtic for God and a-I-D-H, a house, hence the word Lug, L-U-G-H-A-I-D-H. Ugh, you're talking about the Celtic language here. Amerigen, chief bard to King Dermod, monarch of Ireland in the 6th century, in the notes of the annals of the Four Masters, refers, refers to Tia Tefi as follows. A rampart was raised around her house for Tia, the daughter of Luke H A I D H. She was buried outside, buried outside in her mound and from her it was named Tia Timur. The parent to cheer assigned to Tia Tifa could have been for no other reason than that she was the daughter of God's house to the people to whom she brought God's house, the stone, which was their shepherd stone, i.e. Bethel. Morton W. Spencer says that Leah, sometimes spelled E-L-E-A-G, is an Irish word and means a stone, but that fail, P-H-A-I-L, is Hebrew and is it itself a scripture word and is of the deepest import for its means wonderful and is so translated in Isaiah 9 and 6. This we have verified and it clinches our thought that the Bethel stone or Leah fail the stone wonderful is indeed a symbol of that divine rock, the wonderful wrong, the wonderful one, the rock of our salvation. The fact that there are iron rings in the stone, which is in the coronation chair, and that they are worn is remarkable. The question arises, how and when were they worn? It could not have been in the royal halls of Terra, nor in the Abbey of Scone, nor since it came to Westminster, nor in the Temple of Jerusalem. But surely it could have been for when for 40 years Israel journeyed through the wilderness and had both literal and spiritual drink 
from their shepherd rocks that followed them. The classic Hebrew, the modern classic Hebrew uses little dots like periods to represent the vowel sounds. These dots are placed in various positions about the alphabetic characters which represents the consonant sounds. But it is a well-known fact that in ancient Hebrew writings, both secular and sacred, there are no characters, not even the little dots, to represent the vowel sounds. Hence, the vowels are absolutely unwritten, and the consonants of our word are so arranged that the speaker is compelled to give the vowel sound while pronouncing the consonants. Take, for instance, the word Bethel. There in the original, we have only that which is equivalent to the English B-T-H-L. At Bethel, we have already shown when Jacob set up the Bethel stone, he used it for an altar at which he worshipped and upon which he made his vow. Professor Totten of New Haven says, the altars of ancient Ireland were called Botal or Bothal, meaning the house of God. That is, it is the Hebrew word B, T, H, and L, and has the same meaning. Bob's note here. I keep telling you, everybody. The Celtic and Welsh language has its roots in Hebrew. German, too. Let me tell you something, people. Um, I was in the Army during the tail end of the Vietnam War. Yeah, I'm old. I know, that's ancient history for a lot of people. And I went to Germany because I wanted to see the old country. I enlisted to go to Germany. Didn't want to go. Didn't want anything to do with Vietnam. And I knew Vietnam was winding down. So, yeah. And I figured, hey, beer, right? Good beer. Um, yeah, that was my mindset back then. You know, stupid 19-year-old. And uh, I was, you know, when you're in Germany, off base, you're listening to German people and, you know, learning how to speak the language a little bit. I took a class in German in high school, didn't pass it, but, you know. Uh, but years later, when I, uh, when the Lord found me and I found the Lord, uh, I started studying Hebrew and noticed Hebrew words and German, how they sound alike. Oh, yeah. Ha. <laughs> You know, so, and if you look at the ancient Germanic uh, alphabet script and look at Hebrew, they look alike. Now, I'm talking the stuff, you know, like four or 500 years ago, you know, 500 years ago. Look at, and, and, and if you listen to people like the Christadelphians, uh, they'll tell you, oh, the Germans are Assyria. Well, guess what? Israel came out of Assyria. Yeah. And the Assyrians took part of Judah too. They tried to take Jerusalem, but they couldn't do it. An angel of the Lord uh, struck down 80-something thousand uh, Assyrian soldiers when they tried to uh, uh, take Jerusalem. But the Assyrians took not only Israel, but a large portion of Judah too, like a lot of the uh, surrounding smaller towns and cities and villages. And carried them captive. You know? Ooh, the Germans are Assyria. They came from Assyria. So they're Assyrians. Uh, that's what you get for being, listening to any kind of big organization. You know? Eh, whatever. All right. Thus, the Bethel stone again proves itself to be a perfect type of Christ. For although Christ is many other things, he is also the Christian's altar. Proof. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? In this we see that the altar is that which sanctifies. Elsewhere we are told that Jesus Christ of God is made unto us sanctification. Since it is the altar which does the sanctifying, then he who sanctifies is the altar. Thus it is written, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle, 
Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people, i.e., do that which the altar does, with his own blood, suffereth without the gate. Um, I'd have to look this up where this quote is, but it's, it's in the Bible. Yes, the altar shepherd was smitten, and concerning the other rock, Dean Stanley speaks of the crack, which he says was all but rent its solid mass asunder. Could it be possible that rent was made when, and because Moses smote the rock when he was told to speak to it? But be this as it may, history has made it impossible to escape the fact, the fact that, like a true shepherd, this stone has followed the fortunes and misfortunes of its people for 2,500 years. Joshua, at one time, took a stone, set it up, and said unto all Israel, Behold, this stone, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it, it hath heard all the words of the Lord, which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. Thus we see that a great stone may be a witness, and the historians of Great Britain, either wittingly or unwittingly, have made Leah fail, sometimes spelled L-E-A-G-P-H-A-I-L, a witness to an unbroken line of sovereigns, for it has been the throne upon which their rulers have been consecutively crowned ever since it was landed in Ireland. Further, there have been just three overturns of this kingdom. The first, as we have shown, was from Palestine to Tara and the plantation of Ulster through Teotiphi, Jeremiah's ward, the king's daughter. The second overturn was from Ireland to Scotland through Fergus, who sent for Leophael the Stone of Destiny and had it brought from Tara to Iona, where he was crowned. Uh, Bob's note here, Iona, I-O-N-A. That's in Scotland, but it's a Greek word. What was the New Testament written in? Greek. Yeah, the Greeks... Believe it or not, the Greeks were, uh, some of the Greeks were um, Hebrews. What, Chaplain Bob? You're crazy. Oh, really? Am I? Am I really crazy? Let's take a look. All right, let's turn to the book of Joel, chapter 3. I'm just going to read verse 6. That's it. Uh, if you're interested, you can go to Joel, chapter 3. Um, but it says, The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. So here it is, the children of Judah and Jerusalem were sold as slaves unto some of the Greeks, the Grecians, the Greeks. So there is Judah and Jerusalem in Greece, absolutely. And this is Old Testament times. So, yeah. You know, the Bible is a mystery to the average demon nominational churchgoer because they don't bother to read it, you know. People died to give us the Bible, and they won't even bother to waste their time reading it. You know, <laughs> what can I tell you? But uh, Iona, I-O-N-A, is a Greek word, but it's in Scotland. Uh, yeah, you know. Uh, so Fergus, who sent for Leah Fail, the stone of destiny, and had it brought from Tara to Iona, where he was crowned. The third overturn was from Scotland to England. At the time, the throne was brought from Scotland and placed in Westminster Abbey, where it rests under the protection of the greatest monarch on earth. And a hundred years ago uh, or so, England was 
like considered uh, the greatest monarch on earth the most you know sun never set on the british empire britain ruled the waves i mean you know they they had the largest navy in the world so hence if this coronation stone which is in westminster which the english called jacob's pillow and which their scottish and Ir irish ancestors called god's house bethel the stone of destiny and Leah fail, the stone wonderful, we say, if the stone is indeed what those names and what its history declares it to be, then it is indeed the veritable throne of Israel, and upon which the sons of David were formally crowned in the temple of God at Jerusalem. Consequently, in this also, God has kept faith with David and preserved his throne through all generations that are past. This makes us feel like singing the doxology because it is just as it should be. When the Bethel stone was in Bethel place, it was God's house. In God's house, when it was in the temple, it was still God's house in God's house. When as one of the jewels of empire, it was taken by Tia, the tender twig and placed in the heights of Israel in the isles of the sea. It is still God's house in God's house. The descendants of Tia and Haramon are the custodians of that rock today and their subjects possess all the distinguishing marks whereby prophecy clears the lost house of God shall finally be recognized and found. And in the midst of this great national or racial house, there is a house of God, a spiritual house which is by some called spiritual Israel and which is like literal Israel was founded on a rock. And that people is the end of the chapter. That was page 258. The next chapter will be chapter four. And the title of that chapter is Dan the serpent's trail. I don't even remember this. Uh, a lot of this I don't remember. I mean, you know, it, I read this over 30 years ago. So it's a nice refresher. So, but uh, sadly, I think the uh, serpent seed blood has infiltrated the royal family there was a um a kid i don't remember i don't i don't remember if it was a boy or a girl um uh, and i think they were in middle school maybe high school i don't know but they traced the uh genealogy of all the presidents you know like washington and and even the modern ones like Bush uh, and others and discovered they were traced them back to England to uh, royalty. Yeah, they had royal blood. So, you know, it makes you wonder. I don't know about Obama, but uh, this was this was done prior to Obama. So, but I, I actually think uh, Elizabeth and her family are serpent. Yeah. Yeah, it makes, makes, you know, makes, makes me wonder. So, all righty. Well, you know, Chaplain Bob here. Um, hope you are enjoying this particular book. I'm just as shocked as anybody else is that I'm still on tube. Uh, really shocked. So either they're collecting everybody's names that listen to me or I'm one of them. Ha <laughs> ha How could I still be on tube? So everybody keeps asking me, oh yeah, let's find another channel, you know, or another platform. Well, Gab was a bust. Bright Eon was a bust. Bitshoot uh mutes my audios 
World Truth was a bust. They're not even online most of the time anymore. Uh, Telegram, I had a swarm of devils flood my channel with garbage. I should have taken care of that right away, but I didn't. You know, um, let's see. I heard Brand New Tube, which I have a few things on. Um, I heard they were deleting... Uh, People that I trust were telling me they were getting their videos deleted. Odyssey, well, I've got a few things here and there on Odyssey, but um, you know, there's it's getting it's getting to be there's nowhere to go. It, it really it really is. So, like I say, send me a USB, a fairly fast one, uh, you know, like a 3.0 or whatever at least 64 gig. I'll send you everything that I have that you'll have for future reference because there's going to come a day when all this is going to be gone. And I've got written Bible studies too that you can print out and stash away. So even when the internet goes down or there's no electric or no computers, uh, got some interesting stuff. So like defending the Godhead. Uh, some people call it the Trinity, but, you know, uh, man has a body, a soul, and a spirit. And God says that he made man in his image. So why can't God be a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? You know, body, soul, and spirit. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, right? Christ had a body, and God the Father would, I guess, would be likened unto the soul. The, the mind, the leader. Uh, I got all kinds of written studies. I've got all kinds of PDF history books. Um, the Bible on uh, in printed format text. All you got to do is take it to a print shop and print it out. You know, I mean, I've spent years and years collecting all this stuff and it's time to, to share it put it away people you know when the electric goes out this kind of information will never come be a be a, will not be a, allowed it will not be allowed they're gonna well i think it's uh I think it's Amos talks about a famine in the land, not so much of bread and water, but of hearing the words of God. You know, these people that don't even know what Bible to use. I mean, you know, the NIV is a LBGT friendly Bible. Yeah. What does that tell you? You know, when you got churches in San Francisco, so-called, using the NIV, what does that tell you? What does that tell you? You notice they don't use the King James because the book of Leviticus and, and chapter one of the book of Romans, uh, yeah, yeah, they don't want to hear that stuff. So, you know, they don't even know what Bible to use. Was Mary a virgin or was she just a young woman? Is Jesus God in the flesh, or is he just a good man that became God? I mean, these are important questions. You know, they really are. I mean, you know, uh, I don't know what to tell you. But, uh, you know, I've spent the last, oh, I don't know, close, around a decade, um, warning people to the best of my ability. And, um, you know, I've collected a lot of information through the years. I mean, if you spend eight hours a day going through all the stuff that I have, uh, not just the audios, but the videos and the, uh, the, the written stuff, it would probably take you the, the good part of six months to, a, you know, or more to uh, go through it all. And just send me an, an SD card or a USB drive. Uh, if you're overseas, send me an SD card. 
please at least 64 gig if you're uh if you're uh, in the u.s a usb drive is good i'll even buy the envelope and pay the postage i don't care so you could just send it uh you know get my address and have amazon send it to me let them pay for the postage i'll get it in like a day or two and i i i've sent these things out all uh, several a number of different countries so like I say people it's it's getting real but they're gonna have to uh, crash the economy which they're working hard on doing and uh, and then implement their uh, their great reset which will include uh, the getting rid of what they call cash and um, they already got plans so yeah they got plans already so all this digital cryptocurrency stuff they got plans of course God has plans too so all right everybody what can I tell you I'm <sighs> just disgusted with everything so all blessings praise glory and honor to god the father and his only begotten son jesus who is the christ the lamb of god slain from the foundation of the world all blessings praise glory and honor in jesus name amen <laughs>